Welcome to Witch Talks, the series for spiritual seekers, witches, and enlightened souls. I'm Hannah the Suburban Witch, professional tarot reader, astrologer, and witch, and I hope you're ready to get up close and personal with your favorite witches. Well, hi there. Hello. Welcome. And get ready for the finale episode for season two of the Witch Talks podcast. Yay! Woo! Go Hannah! We love your podcast! It's the best! Please don't go on a break, even though we know you deserve it! Ah, oh, shucks. So today we have an absolutely stellar episode for you as we chat about demons and negative entities with Michelle Ballanger, who I would say is one of the world's most renowned demonographers and possibly the best person to talk on this subject. Before I introduce our incredible guest though, there's a few things I want to chat about. First, especially since this is our finale episode and I won't get a chance to talk to you again for a couple of months. First things first, yes, we are coming back. I promise you that. I have already recorded episode one of season three, so don't worry, we're gonna be back. As to when that will be, I'm not 100% sure yet. It depends how organized I can be or want to be in getting prepared with extra episodes for you. But the goal is around August or September, is what I'm thinking. In the meantime, there is lots of content here. Today marks our 60th episode, so you have so much to go back and listen to if you haven't listened to all of the episodes just yet. You can also find your favorite ones on our YouTube channel and watch me chatting with the guests. And if you are a huge fan of the podcast, like I know many of you are, you can sign up as a Suburban Witches Society member and get access to the uncut episodes. For example, what you won't hear in today's episode, which is the edited for the public episode, is an extra in-depth conversation about Lilith and where the concept of an incubus and a succubus comes from. We even touched on Neil Gaiman and Sandman and a few other interesting things in literature and where people have drawn inspiration from these myths and legends of demons and fallen angels and how that's made it through into pop culture. So there's about six minutes extra that you are missing out on if you're not in the Suburban Witches Society. So if you want to hear that, it is very juicy and you can find that in the uncut episodes for members only. That's not all society members get this month. They're also getting a video, which is an altar refresh. Like I have filmed my own altar refresh to just give you a little guidance in how to set up an altar, what goes into it, what I do and how I refresh it to help you on your path as well. We also have a thriving group chat. And this month we're doing some magic mail, which I hope will become a regular thing where we're all sending each other letters. So everyone has someone to send a letter to and no one knows who has them. So it's like a secret Santa witchy mail. And it's just a lot of fun. So jump on over. There's a link obviously in the description box for this episode or go to suburbanwitchery.com forward slash society. And guess what? I'm going to give you guys a discount code. You can get your first month for only $10 ten dollars and you can just absorb all of the amazing resources for ten dollars like this is so cheap ten dollars by using the code demon d-e-m-o-n demon so with that out of the way i would love to introduce our guest so let's get into it In this episode, I'm chatting with Michelle Ballanger. Now, this intro is long but well-deserved, so sit tight. Michelle Ballanger is an occult expert and the author of more than 30 books on paranormal topics. They are the founder and lead clergy of the magical group House Capero, but you might know them better for their work as a psychic medium and occult expert on A&E's Paranormal State and Osborne Media's Portals to Hell. Michelle has been consulted for numerous documentaries, books, and courses. They have lectured on paranormal and occult topics at colleges and universities across North America, and also contributed work to projects such as Marvel AR, HBO's True Blood, CNN Headline News, 
CSI, Nox Arcana, and multiple role-playing games. So I couldn't think of anyone better to have on today to chat about our topic, which is demons and negative entities, which I know you are all chomping at the bit to learn about because I've had so many messages. So I hope you enjoyed today's one. We're going to get into it right now. Michelle is joining us via Zoom all the way from Cleveland, Ohio. Hey, Michelle, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. This is going to be fun. Oh, I'm so excited. Very, very excited. Uh, Demonology, or I guess you call it demonography, and the study of that is something I'm very keen on because I have a little bit of religious trauma, and uh, I think some of us do work through that by going into the Mm -hmm. darker aspects, uh, which can be kind of fun. So I'm excited to have you here. Now, I wanted to start off with what might be a loaded question, but one that everyone wants to know. And that is what would make you label something a negative entity? And then in contrast, mm-hmm. how would you define the term demon? So what is going to be the difference? Are all negative entities demons? And if not, what would you say defines the two? I'm actually going to start with my definition of demon first, because it is very specific. Um, and I had to be really clear with like bullet points when we were doing investigations. Because, you know, if you watch any paranormal TV, everything's a demon for some people, like everything, yeah. like it. They just can't like fart and not think that there's a demon in the room. Um, so for me, because I have encountered a few things that actually fit the bill. Um, and this is based on not only like theological stuff, because I also have this similar religious trauma, um, you know, raised, raised Catholic, educated by Jesuits, uh, but also like where the roots of these ideas come from in, in our traditions. So uh, to be labeled a demon by me, it a spirit, an entity, it must be clearly non-human in origin, clearly intelligent, like vastly intelligent, wickedly, like way more intelligent than, you know, something that's got like a Moriarty level of like evil genius. Actively malevolent, not just kind of damaged and traumatic and like, you know, lashing out or anything but like this is something that has a calculated evil to its actions and the the fourth thing is is that is for some reason very focused on people um like actively not merely impacting humans as collateral damage but actively targeting them for something usually with the intent of uh, finding some way to control or even skin ride them, like actually get into them. Uh, so non-human, hyper-intelligent, demonstrably malevolent and fixated on doing damage to people. Now that is a very tiny little category of things that actually hit all of those check boxes. Mm. There's a lot of things that fall under the broader umbrella of negative entity. And the hard thing is when we say negative entity, a lot of the times what we're encountering is something that's traumatic. Like it itself, that spirit has been traumatized and is reacting in a way that is harmful, but not necessarily coming from a place where it's trying to cause harm. Uh, so there are definitely entities that are and in spirits and even human spirits that are attracted to difficult situations that feed on terror and fear. And that is sometimes just a personality thing. Like we have humans who are just awful people and they like to be in dominant positions. They like to victimize people. Uh, you know, we see it in the media, we see it all over the place. Like we, 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 we all have at least somebody in mm-hmm. our lives that like that and they're you know if they were to shuffle off this mortal coil and nothing changed in their behavior they would definitely be a negative entity when you encounter them in the world that said it's rarely something as easy as black and white uh like like these sort of like polarized categories uh my experience with spirits and, and working with things is it's much more gray space Uh, So to find something that is ever wholly, completely, and irredeemably a negative entity, uh, again, is a very unlikely prospect. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, much like running into people, there there will be one. Um, For for a spirit to be a negative entity, it fixates on, is drawn to, or feeds off of emotions that are 
uh, detrimental to us or tries to, to inspire them. Uh, fear, uh, domination, uh, trying to victimize people, like, like anything that's actually really gets off for whatever reason on causing harm to others. Would you label something like a thought form that has, mm -hmm. I, I guess, is is not putting out positive stuff into the world? Would that be something you would label as a negative entity that is separate from an earthbound spirit mm -hmm. or a human spirit, but not quite in the demonic category? For me, it would be situational. Um, so that's where it gets into some really weird bits with labeling because I some of the most pernicious hauntings, and, and honestly, the, the most common haunting that we will mistake for a demon or a, a, an entity that's victimizing on us is uh, someplace where really bad things happen or just somebody who had depression, like lived there and like it just soaked into the space and all of that detritus of unpleasant emotion and like the the 3 a.m like just just mm -hmm. getting stuck in your head and feeling miserable it, it soaks into the floorboards and into the walls and that creates a sort of like miasma in that space where even if the person is no longer there they might still be living it's not their ghost it's it's just what's rubbed off um, and it will feel like a negative entity because that energy those emotions just start to seep into us as well the i don't know if you're old enough to or, or country-wise like we growing up lots of people smoked cigarettes and like it wasn't uncommon to go to a relative's house and like the walls were yellow with nicotine or you would like move into a new house and there'd been a smoker and like that 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 scent of tobacco just just, mm. just would ooze out and like at certain times the humidity peaked and the rooms would just suddenly like almost bleed cigarette smoke. Beautiful and, imagery. <laughs> but, but that's how uh, those thought forms, mm. those memory ghosts are like. It's like the tobacco smoke that is soaked into a space. Mm. It is toxic, but it's also completely impersonal. Um, there, there's no direct intent of malevolence, but we will still suffer for it. Yeah, absolutely. Do you find that a common thing in, in things like paranormal investigations that you're coming up? Is that sort of the most common yeah. bad feeling that people get when they go into somewhere and they go, oh, it must be haunted by a ghost and it's really more this sort of environment that the, the place is in? Yeah, yeah. The majority of things that we're mistaking for, for ghosts, demons, negative entities is an environmental effect. Mm -hmm. uh, think about the places that were frequently on the television shows, especially investigating abandoned prisons, yeah. asylums, hospitals, nursing homes where just horrible stuff happened. Uh, and, you know, we're not talking a single person who sat in a room in misery. We're talking about just this this stratified, just ridiculous saturation of of atrocity upon atrocity. And we are whether we're aware of being sensitive, whether we would ever label ourselves psychic, we are, we react to that. Um, even if you can't smell the, the the gas in a room, it's still going to poison you. Mm. Yeah, I 100% believe that. I, I have the belief that everyone is psychic, just not yeah. everyone's aware of it and not everyone is developing it or, or knows how to utilise it. So I think it absolutely affects everybody whether they realize, realize or not so in that case when when people come across things like that obviously that sort of memory of feeling I guess that's not going to react to people in in a haunting sense right it's it's a things might feel not good but you're not going to have slamming doors and cupboards left open and knocking and those sorts of things that we see in a lot of those tv shows so is that where it would possibly go to an earthbound spirit that is caught in that area or uh, possibly something worse? Yeah, that's usually sort of my way of telling is simply walking into a space. It is possible, if you're sensitive enough, that you'll pick up blips of events that have happened before that are literally like burned into the space. That's not enough to say that those people's ghosts are there. My, my mm -hmm. favorite example is... 
uh, a haunted battlefield. There's haunted battlefields all over the globe. They stretch back to like, we've got stories about them from Greek and Roman times. Uh, and it's, I don't think a lot of people stop and think that like, clearly not every single soldier who fought in that bot battle is now an earthbound spirit condemned to repeat the battle. Like you're seeing basically a, a recording locked mm -hmm. in, in time and space there. If you get whatever that is to react to you intelligently, for me, that's the first thread of there's something here in addition to, or is actually what I'm mistaking for uh, a, a residual haunting. Mm. Uh, it's, it's common to have both. Actually, it's, it's incredibly common to have both. So when I do a walkthrough in one of the spaces, so much of it is about peeling back these layers because the emotion usually comes through first and loudest and intelligent spirits. Well, they're, they're not without their own ability to perceive us. So when you go into a space, of course they're checking you out and they may not even try to communicate. Uh, the, the kinder ones, uh, the scared ones, the ones that aren't like just going to get up in your faces, like, like big old Billy, you know, like, 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 you know, bad ones, uh, often hide. Like they, they don't necessarily want to engage. There, there's a certain, <sighs> with ghost investigations and the ghost shows, there's this, uh, I, I think, I don't want to say inappropriate, but like there's an assumption that anything that's an intelligent spirit is just going to jump at the opportunity to talk to you. Mm. And, and that's, that's simply not the case. But uh, so we go into a location, there's just this oppressive miasma of, of ick, and you sort through uh, flashes of, of torture or somebody sitting in a corner crying or murder. Uh, simply because you see the people to whom this has happened in those visions doesn't necessarily mean that their ghosts are there and earthbound. But if something begins to react to your questions, uh, speak in real time, communicate in some way, uh, whether it's moving things, rapping, or you end up with a conversation in your head with information that you can then verify, uh, for me, that's where it starts to lead into, all right, there's there's an entity here of some sort. Now let's mm -hmm. try to figure out, is it a human entity? Um, is it something that was drawn to the space because of what happened there? Is it something born from the space? Which is a little trickier thing with the idea of thought forms and egregores. But I've, mm. I've encountered some instances where there was such an overwhelming structure of repeated uh, emotion and trauma and stuff that, that something kind of grew out of it mm -hmm. and became a separate thing. Uh, I think of them a little bit like, like psychic AI. Uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily something that we would think of as, as born or created wherever anything else comes from, but it, it became aware and became something that could interact with you. It, it, there's, there's definitely a cult, uh, techniques for doing things like that so it's not completely beyond the pale mm. yeah it's just interesting to hear of it happening without the assistance or the intent of a practitioner to create yeah. that so that's no I, i've seen it happen spontaneously in a few places and it, like i think the first time i i ran across something like that was in college and I, i'll be honest in college it blew my mind where i was like i think this is what's happening this is so weird like this isn't even like like it's just like the shape of a thing and 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 now it's a thing like how how does that work <laughs> yeah it must be so difficult to almost articulate some of these things as to what you're perceiving i've read one of your books haunting experiences and i found that so enlightening because it helped validate for me when i was picking things up that i was like oh that i dismissed it cuz i was like that can't be it because it's it has no form or it looks like sludge mm -hmm. or it's it's obviously not a thing i'm making it up and then i read your book and was like oh, i'm not alone oh mm -hmm. this is a thing it can present this way so i think that's wonderful that you've been able to provide that for other people like myself but it must have been hard for you when you were first I, I guess, understanding what you could do and what you could see and trying to explain that to other people. Did you, did you well, find that difficult? 
Yes. Well, and also like that, that knee jerk, oh, it's gotta be because, okay. So there's like these, these three layers through which our perception goes there. There's the raw ability to perceive anything and everybody has it, but it, everybody's going to have it to a different degree. There's the way in which your, your, your brain is going to try to like interpret what you're perceiving when it is something that is outside of your ordinary range of perceptions. It doesn't really fit neatly in your five physical things because it's not really part of the physical world as we understand it. And then there's the, the, the entity or being or, or phenomena itself, which again, does not fit neatly, sometimes even into like three dimensions. It's, it's mm -hmm. just not something that we can perceive very easily. The way in which it goes through those three things, like from starting here through trying to like interpret, to trying to like then articulate that, we don't have language for most of it. And our brains are associative when we don't know what else to do with a perception, it'll be, it's most like this. Depending on what your cultural background is, your pop cultural background is, your belief system, the belief system you grew up in and, and rejected whatever, your brain just sort of like grabs whatever it can out of your like unconscious mind and be like, hey, this thing looks like, I don't know, it's like nature and shiny, it's a fairy. <laughs> Yep. And like, you'll get like, like these images of like, okay, fairy though, but how literal should I take that? Mm -hmm. And, and it's taught me that, uh, in the spirit world form is also a language and method of communication, uh, and, and therefore changeable sometimes in dire need of interpretation, uh, and, and sometimes something that is interlocuted by both the spirit and the person like we're trying to find a uh, middle ground in manifestation how the thing manifests to communicate what it actually is mm. yeah but getting there <laughs> 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 oh i could only imagine now one thing i know that a lot of people often come to me about and want to know about is in terms of hauntings and demons and negative entities the really common what I believe uh, misconception that is coming from things like pop culture and the church is that witchcraft uh, occult topics uh, tarot cards all of that is going to attract these things to people I had that belief when I first began I remember it took me over a year to pick up my first tarot deck because I was convinced a portal to hell was going to open up next to me and a demon was going to jump out. Obviously, that didn't happen. It still hasn't happened, but it was a very real fear that I had. So have you seen any instances where this, this has happened? It might be a rational fear in mm -hmm. some ways. I think that it is a fear that is definitely fed by pop culture. Um, I worked with Lorraine Warren, who is like the grandmother of the satanic panic in a lot of ways. Uh, she and her husband, Ed, were self-proclaimed exorcists. Uh, they were working in the 70s and 80s. They really promoted, like, like she was one of the, like, to her dying breath, was certain tarot decks like she's got they, they they collected like this whole museum of haunted objects and she's got a tarot deck that's you know clearly a ouija board was always going to open a portal to hell it was just it was all bad but she was also raised very catholic extremely catholic um and she was looking at the world through her own lens as we all must and we had a specific investigation in uh, a paranormal state. They cut all of this because, of course, it's it's it, it's an inconvenient narrative. Um, she and I did separate readings of the location. We hit on the same spots in the house. We had the same interpretation of what was going on. And at that point, it did not involve demonology, magic, witchcraft, or anything else. In the course of doing the, like, let's talk to the spirits part of the night, in the eldest daughter's room, uh, just sort of casually looking around because uh, physical investigation is a part of, of those investigations, we found a Ouija board and some witchcraft books tucked under her bed. The instant that that happened, Lorraine changed her entire tune about what was going on in this house. And 
previously we both had felt that that daughter's room felt strangely separate from everything else that was going on. I didn't want to out her, but I was like, I can see she put up wards. She was cleansing her room. She clearly mm. was a she had a little altar that she tucked away in a jewelry box. I found that. And I'm just like, that's not for anybody else. Yeah. Uh, but but Lorraine just lost it over it. And we sat for 30 minutes on this girl's bed, just going back and forth of like, just because somebody might use this this way. We need to talk to the daughter because all of these are just tools. I could use a hammer to bash somebody's skull in or to hammer a nail and build a house. Mm. And it's the same thing. They are all merely tools. So the only times in which I have seen uh, a Ouija board or any kind of magical implements lead to something hairy is when the people using them are either so certain uh, that that's going to happen that, that it's something that they are really tapping into uh, or that they're using it to draw on those pop culture ideas mm -hmm. with the express intent of let's cause some trouble and see if we can't summon a demon. I want to talk to Satan through my Ouija board because that seems like fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I often say to people, if you go in wanting to be scared, you will probably get scared because almost that belief, you will find ways to, to make that happen. Uh, so it is it is good to hear and in terms of it's not always the case, that's not going to happen. A lot of it comes with your attitude and your beliefs around it as well. So that's, yeah. I'm sure, a lot of people, you know, wanting to pick up a tarot deck. I, I try and tell them myself, I'm like, it's fine. You're not going to do it. It's not going to summon anything to you just because you have a pack of cards with you. Uh, but I, I'm sure people love to hear an expert's opinion on that absolutely as well. Well, and I think one of the things that really takes the teeth out of something that seems scary and intimidating is learning about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so like if your only exposure to the idea of, of tarot, we'll take, we'll, we'll pick on tarot, is that like there's a devil card and there's a death card and if it comes up, terrible things are going to happen. Um, and, and maybe the, the cards are possessed or something. Take some time to learn like where did tarot come from? It was actually a card game initially. Uh, and it, it, playing cards also have a long tradition of being used for divination. Honestly, anything that is uh, that can be randomized. I had a friend who developed a very freakishly accurate uh, divination system with an American candy called Spree, which came in a roll and were multiple colors. And like, depending on where it was in the roll and what color it was. And it was, he went on the theory of like, divination is about, finding random things and letting them be a mirror mm -hmm. for your own. I love that. I have a friend as well. He's a psychic medium and he can read carpet. <laughs> so yeah. he will walk into someone's house and whatever images are already on the carpet from general everyday wear and tear, he's basically scrying with the carpet mm -hmm. to give them a reading. And I think it's the most glorious example of divination and the diversity that it has with it. It's really wonderful. Yeah. So you are the source of almost all of the real power that goes into any of these things. Uh, the tools themselves are a way of externalizing that power. Uh, if you're afraid of your own power, uh, if you've been taught to be afraid of your own power, that's where things get dodgy mm -hmm. because what you are bringing out, the emotions you come to the table with, even the suppressed emotions especially, the suppressed emotions. Those are the ones that are going to sneak up and kind of bite you on the butt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I I grew up Pentecostal, so mm -hmm. my understanding of demons was very, very warped to what it is now, as I'm sure you can imagine. I thought demons were literally everywhere, always mm -hmm. talking in my ear, hiding under my bed, just waiting for any chance to get me, basically. Uh, I've had to really work hard to deconstruct that and to understand that. And that is where, as I said earlier, this um, things like I've got your book here, the, the Dictionary of Demons, which a lot of my fascination with, with demons, demonology or demonography, however you want to term it, comes from trying to dispel that fear and mm. learn where it comes from. And it's been really, really fascinating going through this and I, I work through a lot of that with writing and creating stories and things. The whole concept of fallen angels, Absolutely thrilled me. 
But for a lot of people, I'm sure there are a few misconceptions. I know you've defined what you term a demon, but would you say there are any misconceptions that people have in their belief of what demons are? Like, for example, mm-hmm. I thought they were everywhere. I'm presuming they're far less common than that. What What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, theologically, it, it's actually why I personally use the word demonographer for myself in my study of, of demons. So in the paranormal community, I'm probably one of the only people who has an actual degree in this. My degree is in comparative religious studies. I went to a Jesuit college. I had an actual course in demonology. Um, I, I err on the side of not calling myself a demonologist because there's a theological element that is implicit in that. And for me, I am coming at it more from the perspective of a folklorist, someone who is comparing multiple different belief systems without engaging in actual like faith-based mm-hmm. stuff. Um, so to answer the question though, like how common are like the things that actually check those boxes of this is a non-human, hyper-intelligent entity, doesn't seem like it came from around here and it really just has a mad on for hurting people incredibly rare uh, we, we with paranormal state especially like the the sort of angle for the show was because it was you know connected with the warrens was hunting demons uh, a, a little known fact like supernatural the fictional television series and paranormal state were like kind of side by side and they like shared certain beats in common uh, by design and that was to try to like give a certain urgency to the paranormal reality TV show. And that meant that the production company would look for things that they thought were going to be sensationalized, demonic, like just horrible things. The majority of quote unquote demonic cases usually came down to incredible tragedies where people had been so traumatized that their own psyche was acting out um, in a kind of poltergeist style. Mm. Like we're the demons in a lot of cases, like we're the ones causing a lot of the stuff around us in these most extreme cases. But the question of, are there spirits everywhere? Are there energies everywhere? I I think that this is where we get into um, the question of language, labels, interpretation. Mm. Pentecostal beliefs are not wrong in feeling that we exist in a world that is rife with non-physical things around us. But there is this fear woven into it that all of that is something out to get us. Mm -hmm. Whereas genuinely, most of it is minding its own business. There's just entities and people and spirits and uh, you know, residual hauntings and energy of people's emotions. Just, yeah, there's stuff everywhere. But generally, it doesn't care about you. <laughs> it's, it, it's, you're, you're moving through it like you are walking through the, the water at the bottom of the ocean. You know, there, there's tons of things in that water. And it's an ecosystem. You know, sometimes we will interact. And oftentimes, we, we feed one another. Like, like we... We wouldn't exist the same way if all of these things were taken away. Mm -hmm. And when people feel like they have encountered something that might not be doing them any good, uh, they might believe that it is negative, whether it's wanting to be or not. Do you have any tips for how people could Mm -hmm. begin interacting? Is interacting going to feed something and make it worse? Or do we ignore? Do we speak to it? What, What are your tips around dealing with things like a haunting or a negative entity, perceived negative entity? My, my first thing is to determine intent. You go into a place, you feel really, really bad going into the place. It is natural to assume that you have now been attacked, that, that something is out to get you. Uh, but it may simply be that you're really sensitive. You happen to have a resonance with the suffering of something there. So what you're picking up instead is there's a really sad spirit who went through something awful and you're getting to like feel that awful. They're not actually attacking you. And in fact, they need as much help, if not more than you do. So trying to figure out the why is really important. 
And that does require a, a certain amount of like stepping back from the experience. My first best recommendation for anyone who is in a situation or enters a space where they feel like something is harming them, overwhelming them, or having a negative effect on them is to first remove yourself from the, the space if possible, and then go through the grounding, centering, shielding, um, just whatever like protective techniques you have to get some space from the experience. So you have a clearer head to uh, really analyze like, where was I in this space when this happened? What else was I experiencing? Were there images or sensations that actually were communication that were giving me information about this that I was too overwhelmed to be able to process? But you need to be in a good, comfortable, centered space to be able to do that. Uh, so like my, my technique is uh, usually I'll duck into a bathroom and put my hands under the water and let the water roll and, and the tactile sensation, but also just the, the meaning of water as a cleansing thing. I let everything that is bothering me go down the drain with that. And then I find my own center and I establish my space and my boundaries around me. Uh, and it helps that I'm in like, you know, a little space that is kind of set aside as its own space. It's meant to be private. And from there, working from that space of, of centered, sheltered, calm, then I analyze what I was experiencing. And when I'm comfortable, I go back into it with that analytic sort of observer thing while maintaining those boundaries. And if I don't feel anything at all, like I kind of like take that a little bit and it just sort of experiment with, okay, what, what's actually here? Uh, every once in a while, whatever it is, we'll realize that it came on too strong. And, and, it never hurts. It sometimes feels silly uh, to just speak out loud and say, hey, you know, I, I, I think I, I, I can t I can tell you're here <laughs> and that I didn't like that. Please don't do that again. Um, set boundaries. Be clear about them. Vocalize them, um, not only for the spirit, but also for you, because putting things into language helps us be more concrete about it. Uh, but also keep in mind that spirits can be incredibly literal, <laughs> like incredibly literal. Mm -hmm. Choose your language carefully with it. Uh, and then invite dialogue uh, and judge based on the reactions from there. Uh, some things are just not going to want to be worked with. Some things are just, well, assholes. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. you find out pretty quickly, uh, especially if, Something that doesn't mean your harm isn't trying to hurt you. When you go through that like grounding, centering, shielding, and you hold your boundaries and you establish it and you make requests, they won't push. And certainly they won't try to like crumple that stuff in like a direct attack. Uh, and from there you can sort of judge exactly what you're dealing with and then determine, you know, what is what is your strategy for what you want to do? How do you want to respond to this? If it's a space that you can avoid, you can just you know, go off and not have to go deal with it again. If it's a space you as an investigator have been asked to come in and sort out, <laughs> then there's a whole other litany of things that you need to try to do to deal with something because an actual malevolent spirit will not go quietly or easily. Mm. And most people, their first instinct is to go in with some smoke cleansing, which yeah. sometimes can, in my experience, make things a little bit worse as well. <laughs> I, it, it varies. Um, I, oh, I mean, I've I've read widely on, on many different uh, religious like systems for spiritual warfare, like actually dealing with stuff. I'm I'm fond of spirit nails. Uh, the um, Tibetan Buddhism, the the, the fur, basically, you you have a dagger or a, a metal thing that you pierce them, you, know, like you put it into the ground and you ground them and hold them in one spot to, to have, basically to have it out. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing for me is, I mean, spirits are energy. And if you are a well-trained energy worker, you can interact with them on their own turf. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can be difficult because uh, an intelligent and wily spirit if you are just a visitor in a location, you've been called in to solve something, they just wait you out. Like they, they, they don't have to stay. <laughs> They'll just 
okay, well, you're, you're, you're a passing, you're just passing through, like, and, and they'll come back two weeks later. Uh, that's actually one of the hardest things about cleansing space is you can, you can kick it out, you can beat it up, you can, you can put, you know, as many words up as you want, but if you don't teach the people who live there mm. how to protect themselves effectively, it's just going to keep cycling unless this entity finds somewhere else to be, uh, has a sudden change of heart and decides not to be terrible. Um, and yeah, so a lot of my own work has been finding ways to empower the people who are in those situations. Mm-hmm. And f- so much of that is learning, like, what is their spiritual language or their non-spiritual language? Like, how do they find their own centered, sheltered space and establish boundaries and mm-hmm. find things that like really speak to them, whether it is smoke cleansing or setting up like a little altar or a shrine, prayer, whatever their particular thing is, as long as it makes them certain, helps them really believe they're not a victim, they're not open to being victimized and that they can and do have the power to kick the thing out. Mm-hmm. Yep. So the be- the best thing is to empower yourself or empower the people that you're with to know that they they can deal with it yeah. themselves. Mm, I love it's, that. It's all, yeah. No. It's also why I will avoid calling things demons, even if they're demons. Um, mm. I give them silly nicknames. I give them derisive nicknames. Like the bigger, badder entities just get nicknames that make them feel small. Yep. Um, and I know some people are like, "Well, you're you're antagonizing them." I'm like, "No, I'm." Names have power, mm-hmm. uh, both in us and when you are when you are naming something. So it it might be like, no, I want you to call me like I I I am the darkness. Call me the darkness. I'm like, you're you're Mr. Oogie Boogie. Go away. Like just yeah. just sit, go go sit in your corner. I've I've dealt with worse humans than you. Please piss mm-hmm. off. <laughs> and it's funny because a lot of the the lore around. Uh, demons is is on their true name and knowing their true Mm -hmm. name in order to control and empower them so do you ever have to use that aspect as well or do you just go with the the silly nickname um in a few very rare cases and i like i can count on one hand um getting to the heart of the the word or the syllables or the sounds that like actually name that entity that is their essence uh if you really want to bind something remove something have enough power over something to not just set boundaries but create a contract so that it has rules for not coming back because like i said spirits tend to be incredibly literal and i won't pretend to understand all of the whys for making contracts like that with some of these intelligent entities seem to hold true. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if you can get to the meat of it and just have a discussion of like, okay, I know I'm dealing with something that's horrible. And also weirdly you're bound by rules too. If I have this, you get just, you know, you are not allowed to do this. You are not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do this. Just yeet off into the distance and never come back. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, yeah, but getting that, that, name um which sometimes is more a set of syllables and a sound and a feeling and something that is more than just language um it helps in some cases to to make a sigil uh that also encapsulates that it's it's not just uh beelzebub Mm -hmm. (laughs) like it's by like some people will read the dictionary of demons or or actually will not read it they're like but but isn't isn't saying the name going to summon them and I'm like oh Mm -hmm. no that's just words uh that's and honestly the more you know the more power you have so that's Mm -hmm. it's okay it's really okay yeah but from a magic perspective there's it's more than just a word yeah when when you were creating the dictionary of demons which how many does how many names are actually in there by the way Uh, 1700 or something like that i mean it's a it's a ridiculous number that's a lot did you have uh did you have a favorite oh i mean leonard the goat there's there's some that are charming just because they are the demonology equivalent of a typo but they've gotten (laughs) passed along so many times that now people 
assume that that's a real entity. Uh, so where a lot of the names in the Dictionary of Demons are drawn from the grimoire tradition of um, predominantly Christianized Western Europe. Uh, I, I had to pick a fairly narrow slice because really this this topic is worldwide and ancient and there's just, it would be an entire like 15 volume set if I like named everything that had a name. Uh, so between about like the 11th century to the, the 18th century, you know, a little wibbly on either end with some callbacks to uh, biblical and extra biblical text and some Sumerian stuff. Cause that's where a lot of our ideas, uh, those of us who are descended from West, you know, Christianized Europe, um, they all will come back to and call back to uh, Sumerian, Babylon, Egypt, uh, that, that fascinating like cultural and, and conceptual cauldron between 300 uh, BCE and 300 CE that was happening in the ancient Middle East. Uh, some of those names are just literally one dude was writing it down. Somebody wrote it down wrong. Nobody wanted to correct him. They weren't sure if he was right. It was passed down through a monastery like five different times. And now you've got these different demons that sort of hive off of one another. Like my favorite ones are the, the ones from the Goetia. Uh, so there's technically these 72 demons of the Goetia, um, folks like Marbus and Visago, and like they get trotted out in everything from Neil Gaiman's Sandman series to you'll mm -hmm. see it. Um, they're yeah, they're, they're they're fun, and by fun I mean they're called demons, and by our tradition now they are definitely demons. But like where they start is very different. Like they their their roots are as tutelary spirits, uh, and they probably were originally the spirits or gods of the 36 decans of the ancient Egyptian zodiac. Mm -hmm. So like they were these astrological beings that had control over uh, certain parts of the body and certain types of health. And, and it got codified as like, this is the spirit that you call up when you have a headache or the spirit that you call up when you want to get it on with somebody or the spirit that you call up when you have tetanus and you would like to not have tetanus. Uh, and it's tied in with the whole Solomonic tradition. Um, so yeah, generally, broadly, the, the 72 demons of the Goetia because of how telling their actual history is with how complicated our concept of what demons really are and, and, and how it is entwined with multiple different cultures, theologies and pantheons and the idea of what is a God and what isn't a God. And those lines for us are incredibly clear, God and demon, mm -hmm. but you go back far enough and the gods and the demons are pretty much the same thing. Like in, I mentioned Sumerian stuff, um, the daughter of Anu, um, the, the, main, the main sky deity, is one of the demons par excellence. Like, like most of the protective rituals that you will find that have survived are against her, Labartu. Um, she's a sort of a proto-Lilith figure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, she is, she's just rank. She's horrible. She does all this nasty stuff. She is like a where all the, like the bad witchcraft and stuff comes from. Like, and she's technically a goddess she's just a goddess who doesn't like humans mm -hmm. and and does horrible things uh, and again we looking from our perspective uh you know in centuries of monotheism millennia of monotheism and the idea that um the augustinian ideal that god would be an all good all powerful all knowing being um, and we really like hit on that all good part, which then mm. means that the other team has to be all bad. Whereas um, this is a, this is a fun one because Pazuzu comes out with like the, uh, the exorcist cycle and like, again, pop culture. So we'll, we'll hear about Pazuzu because of pop culture, but Pazuzu was uh, a, this again, occupied that weird space of technically a demon, but actually like you, he was the demon who like kind of, had control of the other demons. So if you were having a problem with a demon, you asked Pazuzu to like sort it out for you. 
so it gets really thorny when you yeah. look back past of like where these are. It's also why I'm like, well, it really depends on what you mean by demon. Mm -hmm. Because we've been using this word and it's like many words changed and evolved over time. Yeah, absolutely. And one of you mentioned one of my favorite ones, which is Lilith, uh, who I made it also as a character in my book, uh, because it's such a rich concept and, and history. And, you know, there's the the bad aspect in terms of in, I think, Jewish uh, mythology where where she was going to steal people's babies. And so they would make all these amulets and, and put her name on them to con to, to protect the, their babies. And then we have the, the concept from um, her being Adam's first wife and maybe she's not all bad and there's all these sorts of, and now as well coming from Sumerian that maybe she was a goddess as well, even though she didn't really mm -hmm. like humans. So it's just such a rich history and obviously has adapted through many different things. And then we add in all of the pop culture references to Lilith, which, by the way, this is going to be a really weird segue. I am a True Blood fan, huge True Blood fan, mm -hmm. both of the books and the TV series. And I remember watching the TV series and thinking when they made Bill into Lilith and called him Billeth, I was like, oh, that's so silly. And then <laughs> I read your book and that's when there's the a Billeth. There's a bill yeah. and I was like, oh my gosh, that's actually really clever. <laughs> yeah. And that is one of the ones that was pretty clearly a typo that just kind of <laughs> got carried along. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's great. And I was like, oh, I wonder if True Blood did that on purpose. Do you know? Because you I at, by that season I wasn't directly involved in stuff, but I can say that they were very like dedicated to like digging deep into stuff. So it's not beyond the realm of possibility. It's also just sort of like a fun, like it's like you know, Angelina, it's Jill, or Angelina, like, yep. <laughs> we, and like, again, language is this weird, powerful, strange thing mm -hmm. that like morphs and evolves and mutates like a virus, but also has this incredible power mm -hmm. to shape how we think, to shape the world. You, you speak something into existence. Wordplay, punning used to be high magic, profound magic. Um, and like, that's, at play also with this idea of the power of the names of these beings. And the other, the other thing with those names, um, the dig, the, the further you dig, the more it becomes clear that most of those names, the ones that are legitimate, that were actually their names are titles instead. Mm -hmm. that, that these things are so protective of like the core essence of like what they really are. Uh, like like a lot a lot of the angels from from Enoch, if you go digging around for like the whole idea of the Watcher angels, like Shemyaza, Shemhazai, however you want to pronounce his name, Azazel, most of those come down to strong name, mm. strong, just yeah, the big guy. <laughs> just I variation. Love that. Well, it's kind of like how uh, Satan, because I was raised to believe that Satan was an individual and mm -hmm. then throughout my deconstruction have realized that Satan is a title. It means accuser. And there were even people in the Bible who were called a Satan because they were being an accuser or an adversary against God. So that was really fascinating to understand that distinction between Satan and what we think of as the devil or what we think of as Lucifer, which again also came later to have those words meaning the same thing. So I yeah. think the whole word understanding of how it progresses through history and people and culture is, is just absolutely fascinating. Well, and different cultures will take a word that's like, this sounds like a thing. It sounds like this other thing. And then they kind of mash them together because I looked for years. I There's a couple, there is a thread in certain like left-hand path occultism that like set and Satan, like they're, they're sort of mm -hmm. the same thing. And I was like, there's no textual, like, this just seems, this just seems wrong, except uh, you dig into Ethiopian Coptic stuff. Uh, and there's a book uh, that comes down to us from their stuff in the, the Gez language that's translated by A.E. Wallace Budge. Don't hold that against it. He's one of the only people we've been bothered um, called the mysteries of the heavens and the hells, or sorry, the, the mysteries of the heaven, and the mystery of the earth. Um, the translation there's a whole chapter in there and it's one of the few places where set the Egyptian deity because of the cultural exchange that's happening in this location and the timing, they turn him into Setaniel. And it's 
named as such. And, you know, this is going back to the very early roots of Christianity. So we're talking like, you know, 100 CE, 200, 300 CE, uh, where there were different gods and goddesses that just got kind of like grabbed in and morphed into. It's a little bit like what the Catholics did with a lot of pagan gods and goddesses when they, you know, colonized areas and spread out. Uh, Bridget is probably the best example. Mm -hmm. She's a goddess. She's very much a goddess. They couldn't get rid of her as a goddess. So they just turned her strangely into the nursemaid of Christ. Yep. The Holy family, the whole story where the Holy family went like, took a detour from Bethlehem, Jerusalem, and the Middle East, ended up in Ireland. <laughs> Mary had to go off on business with the baby Jesus and left him with Bridget. Because, sure. <laughs> yep, it makes total sense. <laughs> it, it's totally part of the hagiography of the saint. Uh, because they couldn't they couldn't get rid of the folks who, like, really, like, Bridget was such a big deal. So they just turned her into a saint. Mm. That's not unique to the Catholics, to Christianity. Like people do that all the time. It's where Loki comes from. Loki is a survivor of a previous pantheon and was the, the creator deity of his own thing. It's, we see elements of it with the fact that he is the mother and the father of multiple entities. And they, they couldn't quite stamp him out. So he becomes this sort of like literally the redheaded stepchild mm. and gets woven into it. Uh, so assimilation is one of the ways that we will deal with uh, a no longer convenient or widely accepted God, goddess, or belief system that we can't quite erase. Mm -hmm. So rather than it, we just tell the story differently. Now, you might know about this. I have heard tell that the Old Testament Christian God was actually one of the 70 or 50 lesser gods of the Canaan religion. Mm. Have you heard this one? Do you know much about that? Okay. So there's, there's actually two gods who are named and their names are translated to God for us in the old Testament. There were two different, basically monotheistic pantheons that got mashed together. Um, so Yahweh and Elohim, El, Elohim, El and Baal, Baal, mm -hmm. uh, all the angel names, they all end in L. That just means yes. Lord. God. Half of the God, the names for God in the Old Testament in our Bible is L because it's just the God, one of the gods from that pantheon. Mm -hmm. um, and Elohim, notably, is a plural. So they're talking mm -hmm. about the gods and the goddesses whenever they use that word. But again, in the way that things evolve and change, theologically how we explain that now is god is such an enormous entity that of course we use a royal we <laughs> yeah but that's not how it started ugaritic uh mythology that's that's an, that's where i first ran into that idea that that l started there first um and that the elohim were adapted and turned into you know what we now understand and what, you know, this, as the story is told to us, the elements of the surviving Jewish pantheon exist in the angels. Mm -hmm. All of them were gods that got demoted to the helpers of the big God. Um, you can see it in their names, Raphael, Gabriel, Michael, mm -hmm. uh, that L at the end now is interpreted as, oh, of God, like they are God's little, like, buddies, his henchmen. No, they're, Raphael is the god of healing. Raph, mm -hmm. it, it's there. It's like it's right there. Um, but the evolution of belief, the evolution of religion, it's syncretic. It, it assimilates things and it will, if it can't erase something, it finds a way to change how we look at it, even including taking a plural and establishing it as this one plural is absolutely meant to be one singular God. Mm -hmm. oh, I love it. I love that you're so knowledgeable on all this as well, which makes sense with your comparative religions degree. Did you have to learn when you were especially researching things for like the dictionary of demons, have you had to learn any of these other languages that you're having to read these mm. source texts in, or did you read mostly translations? So I, I read Latin. Um, I read, 
French, Spanish, and Italian well enough to, to muddle my way through stuff. I read enough German to know I should get somebody else to help me with the German. Yep. Um, I got an Orthodox Jew to help me with the Hebrew. Amazing. Because he, like, I just, I can recognize a few letters and beyond that, not much. Um, it was just not my thing. Um, and, and Greek also, it, it's a joke. It's all Greek to me. Uh, <laughs> the Catholic upbringing helped. Um, and yeah, the, the Latin, I would say the hardest, the hardest thing sourcing was I was tracking down um, Wierus's Pseudomonarchia de, de Monum and trying to find the, the original source of some of the stuff. And I had a friend who worked at the University of um, Michigan and she had access but before some of this stuff was like as easily accessible on like Google books and whatnot. She got me into the back end of their, what they were starting to digitalize as their collection. So I got to have a digital access to a copy of this, which was printed in big ornate German block print. Lovely. In like, renaissance latin which is not imperial latin like the church took latin and did some funky stuff with it and not everybody's spelling was even consistent so i'm i'm here trying to like i'm trying to find like one line mm -hmm. to compare somebody who quoted it over and over again wrong um and going through just page after page of this like at three in the morning just my eyes crossing <laughs> like looking at the screen going oh but but why though uh there's actually an italian text that i I wanted to source and I got my hands on like a, a digital version of the copy and the scribe's handwriting was so, I, I tapped out. I was just like, Nope, there's, there's demons in here and I want them, but Nope. <laughs> just <keep going. laughs> oh, that's totally fair. I'm so impressed that you can read in multiple languages. I think that's phenomenally talented and it's wonderful. And so good to, to know that you've got that like, aspect coming into this book it just it's very very good i love that um yeah, no, I, I i love languages like I, and i love the stories that we tell with them I, it probably is you know, indicated by this like just a language and myth and story is is what it's what we build ourselves and our world off of i 100 percent agree absolutely so lastly did i say yeah. that you had a deck that you've created as well about the watcher angels is that Yep, yep. Um, Can you please tell me about that? <laughs> uh, I am enamored with the whole story of the Watcher Angels uh, as in fragments from the Book of Enoch, particularly once I like really hit on the sense that like this is a pantheon that predated what we understand as Jewish monotheism. And like, there are bits and pieces, much like the Loki story that, that of like the real story that comes through there, even though it's been, you know, told and retold and, and redacted and whatnot. Uh, so I set out to kind of tell their story through the major arcana um, and like cast each one of the various named ones that we find in Enoch one and some of the related texts. Because the idea of, you know, here are um, the midrash of Shem Hazai and Azazel um, is probably the, the the best source for how this starts. Is they're angels. They're they're up in the heavens. Their their whole purpose is to look after the humans on earth. Uh, they're presented in this midrash as they're they're basically in the court of God and they're looking down and the humans are just messing the planet up and everything's terrible. Uh, and they're like, hey, Dad, we we could go down and fix that. And he's like, oh man, it's, it's, it's beyond fixing. It's, there's actually a flaw in the space itself. Like there's just a wickedness there. And if you go down there, it's, it's going to hit you too. And they're like, no, no, we can totally fix it. Dad, like, just let us go fix it. We want to fix it. And they go back and forth like that. Um, and eventually it's just sort of like, don't tell me I didn't tell you so like, like you'll be sorry. <laughs> and off they go. And of course, this flaw in the thing, this, this sort of inherent wickedness in the material world gets right into them. And they're just like, hey, baby. <laughs> and they, they, they get enamored by you know, all, of the, all of the flesh and the, the daughters of men and all of the things that you can do here. And they sort of lose track of what they were supposed to be doing and become part of the problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. And... But but that that whole like that mix of heaven and earth that's the other thing because it is the root of 
like two lines in the book of Enoch are probably the very root of most of our beliefs as they've come down to us now of demons, evil spirits, possession, and why they do it. Because these angels come down. That's why I made a point of calling them watcher angels, not Nephilim, not anything else. Cause it's actually, there's a whole line of descent. They come mm. down, they mix with humans. They have children. And those children are neither properly of heaven nor of earth. Mm. They are extraordinary, but they also have these vast appetites that are both physical and spiritual. They would eat the flesh, but also drink the blood. And if you're familiar with Judaism, the blood is the life. It's the reason why you keep kosher, that like that part is for God. Uh, but they ate all of that, like they needed all of that. And the, the world that they created, the empires they created were just rapacious and they spread over everything, and they started to just poison the world. Looking around for all right now. Anyway, um, so that's where the flood story comes in. Mm. A cry goes up to heaven. There's some conversation back and forth between some different archangels and a couple of human intermediaries, Enoch being the main one who does dream visitation. He takes a dream journey to heaven to like actually take it to the seat of the throne of God and be like, please don't kill us all. Maybe. Um, flood happens anyway. Mm -hmm. Because the children are neither of heaven nor earth, they can't really die. Mm -hmm. Physically, they can die. But their spirits are left. They can't leave here. They're still bound to the place where they were born. And they are now angry and jealous. They want everything back. They want to be able to be in bodies. They can't. And so they are now evil spirits that haunt the earth, that prey on humans, that try to obsess them and possess them. And like, mm -hmm. there's like two lines that like set the entire stage for this narrative of what demons are that we live with right now. Oh, I love it. I think it's the most intriguing part of I guess the what my church would call the banned books of the Bible, uh, the most intriguing part to come from it. And it was funny because yeah. being raised, I was, I was taught that there were Nephilim and there were Watcher Angels because it is in Genesis, but very minutely, just a little bit. But then we weren't allowed to read on on any of those other books, <laughs> which is wild. Well, and, and they, they they pop up under because there's different tribes of them. So there's mm. the Nephilim, Anakim, there's the Gibberim, like like and the Rephaim, and like all of them are sort of like all kind of of a kind uh the giants in the mm -hmm. earth and uh the giants when uh you know we were in our own sight as grasshoppers when compared to them when the, the, some some of the israelites were sent off to go scout some stuff and the sons of anak are over there and they've you know buddied up with the the enemy that they're supposed to overcome but the sons of anak are some of the survivors of the flood like that was the other thing is mm. that there was all of them quite got wiped out some of them came back uh, or the idea was um, that there'd been enough intermingling that there were some throwbacks mm -hmm. that every once in a while humanity would spit out someone who was still of watcher blood and have those qualities. Mm -hmm. That idea is taken up by a, a particular narrative in uh, traditional witchcraft with the witch blood. Mm -hmm. That the commingling of heaven and earth because the watchers in Enoch teach humanity the great sin is they teach humanity magic, witchcraft, divination, yeah. how to make weapons, how to make cosmetics, mm -hmm. how to weave cloth and dye it into multiple forms, how to abort unwanted babies. Mm -hmm. Like like there's a whole like litany of of knowledge that was not meant for humans by this particular story. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I always find it interesting that side by side with like necromancy, divination, summoning spirits, aborting babies, you've got jewelry and cosmetics. Yeah. <laughs> like that's bad too. Like, like weaving cloth bad. together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, like weaving cloth, like the, the children of Cain, the children of wickedness at one point mm -hmm. are described in um, oh, the Testament of the patriarchs. I think another one of those, like not allowed in the Bible anymore, but man, are the stories interesting. Yeah. Uh, they're you know them because they wear clothes of many colors and they dance mm -hmm. and and you're just like oh wow okay so that's a dirty bad thing, thing is like 
wow, we, we've been doing that for a while, huh? We just <laughs> really don't like people who have fun. <laughs> Well, I read, I read through now. Um, part of my deconstruction was to make a little bit of a bucket list of all the things I wasn't supposed to do. And mm. I have the, um, I've literally got it here. It's the Foundations of Christian Doctrine. And they've got a, a full-blown multi-page list of all the things you're not supposed to do. And it's it's all the fun stuff. It's, you know, uh, divination of any kind. And there's, you know, mediumship and there's yoga. And there's like all sorts of meditation. I was like, cool, let's just do, or try all of them. This sounds wonderful. <laughs> All yeah, the fun and stuff. the funny thing is usually like I even evangelical Christianity has gotten very, very big in the States and like like they they decry divination and witchcraft and then you'll watch their their little things yep. and they are casting out demons, they mm -hmm. are casting curses against people, they are doing more black magic than mm -hmm. most of the witch and yep because it's within their framework and, and that's really been the history of, of mm. how magic is demonized throughout everything yeah what works for me if it's not sanctioned it's it's bad if you're doing it and you're not underneath the blanket of our acceptable mm -hmm. stuff um like in, inquisitors during the the witch trials and stuff uh textual amulets like like little written charms were really big mm. uh and Often they involved Bible verses, but sometimes sigils, sometimes uh, frequently it was mixed with like biblical stuff and also the sigils of various demons and, and all, it, it, all in a big mash. The Inquisitors would be stripping down the people that they were going to burn or hang or whatever to find their protective amulets while wearing their own. Mm -hmm. That was almost indistinguishable. <laughs> from what but, but because they didn't come from the proper source that was bad and yeah just and sometimes i hate people <laughs> mm -hmm. well when i found out that uh bibliomancy was a, a thing and you know a, a witchy divination thing where you flip open a book and point your finger and get some wisdom and i went oh oh but we did that in church all the time <laughs> that's how mm -hmm. you got a message from god and i was like oh so it's okay when you do it in church but not when you do yep. it out of church. So yes. it's okay with God because it's not divination when it's God because God's the only one who has it. It, it, it does yeah. go that goes go back to if your God has to say put no other gods before me. What that tells you is within the cultural context of when that happened, there were other gods, mm -hmm. and there was a and you had to try to like wrangle people to keep them on the path of this one particular religion. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, implicit in that statement is kind of acknowledging that there are other gods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's um, it's really funny when you yeah, start to pry it all apart. Absolutely. So to wrap up, uh, can you yeah. let us know, is there anything that you're working on at the moment? What What is your, I guess, next project or the next thing that you're doing? What's oh, exciting for you? So the world is on fire. And I have been really just digging into things that bring me joy. So I've been making a lot of games. Uh, I also do a lot of game design. Uh, I can't create something that isn't like, like the, even if it's fiction, even if it's a game, like everything kind of like pulls on my backgrounds and stuff. Uh, my, my favorite project recently was Lonely House, uh, which is a, a combination. It's a novella but it's also a journaling game. So I created this narrative that puts you in a mysterious shifting house. And there are moments in the narrative that put the plot in your hands. And it's sort of a collaborative story between what I've written and whoever's experiencing it. We just had it come out in audiobook. Uh, and just, I've been really experimenting with different forms and things to like let myself find any way of getting through what's going on in the world because there's just some things that are out of my hands mm -hmm. that I can't do anything about. I cannot change. Um, and that's very frustrating. So, so there's that. Uh, we are re-releasing. I got the rights back to a bunch, uh, to my first three books. Um, and so we've been re-releasing new versions of those uh, updated in some cases, like just taking back some of the editing decisions that I didn't agree with. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the current one that will be coming out is dreamwalking the psychic dreamwalking book mm -hmm. very cool very cool and what is the name of your tarot deck what because we i don't think we touched on that 
Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it is the Watcher Angel Tarot. Uh, mm -hmm. You can find it on my website. Uh, there's not a whole lot of places that carry it. We did it totally. I did it indie um, and basically kickstarted it before Kickstarter existed. Mm -hmm. um, and the kind of platform. So there's a limited run. Um, and once they're gone, they're gone. Well, I'm going to have to jump onto your website and snatch up a copy because that is absolutely in my wheelhouse. I am very excited. As when I read about it, I was like, why don't, why don't I have this in my collection already? <laughs> it's, it's hard to find. <laughs> oh gosh. Well, I'm absolutely going to get some. So thank you so, so, so much for joining me today and for sharing your wisdom and all of the fun and dark and light aspects of this topic that a lot of people find really tricky to, to delve, delve yeah. into. So I think it, it will make a lot of people feel a little bit more at ease around some of the, the scary aspects and yeah, call all the scary things, silly names. That's a big takeaway from today, yeah. I think. <laughs> I try not to be scared. Don't give it that power. Yeah, absolutely. Be, be informed instead because knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. I like the term when I first began, I heard the term standing in your dominion and that we yeah. have dominion in this plane. And that was really helpful for me. So I'm sure that's, that's that similar idea of that you have the power in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. You just, you're, yeah. Fantastic. You said the phrase and you can tell it. Go yep. away. <laughs> so I will pop links to your website or in the description below this episode as well. Do you have, are you on social media as well? Uh, yeah, um, Seth Anakim is the the name that you'll find for Twitter slash X, whatever that clusterfuck is, uh, <laughs> and Facebook and YouTube and Instagram. Um, and we can spell it. It's S-E-T-H-A-N-I-K-E-E-M. It is an oblique reference to the Anakim and yeah. Sethaniel and a bunch of stuff. But most people are just like, that's a weird name. I'm like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah. I need to like cite way too many books for that to make any sense. It's fine. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Well, I'll pop that in there as well so people can get in touch if they want to. And you've got on your website, you've got your books and some classes and things as well, don't you? Yeah, books, classes, the weird ancient Egyptian incense that I've recreated, all the decks, because I design decks like constantly. Um, oh, uh, th there's a lot. <laughs> Awesome. Well, everyone, go and check it out. Have a peruse through all of the things that are on offer there because I think if you enjoyed this episode, if you enjoyed this topic, there's going to be so much more for you to, to jump off from from there. Perfect. Thank you very much. And for everyone listening, I hope you have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world today, and I will chat with you next time. See you all. OMG, that was amazing. I 100% was fangirling when I was interviewing Michelle. That was pivotal, amazing career moment for me since I actually am a huge fan. It's one of the best parts about my job is I get to talk to people that I really, really respect and, remi and remire, admire. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, you can get access to the behind the scenes uncut version of this podcast episode for only $10 by using the code DEMON at checkout when you sign up as a Suburban Witches Society member. Simply go to suburbanwitchery.com forward slash society to sign up now. I also want to talk about Michelle's tarot deck because as soon as I recorded this episode, I absolutely did jump onto their website and grab a tarot deck, the Watcher Angel Tarot. Let me tell you, this deck is right up my alley and the guidebook is no joke. It is a literal book, which I flipping love. And I have actually unboxed this. So I've done a little unboxing first impressions review style video. I'm editing it as we speak and that will be ready for you by this Friday, which is the 12th of April, 2024, for you to watch over on my YouTube channel. So you can have a look at what we were talking about in this episode, which is really fun. Another really fun thing here, which if you've listened to some of my episodes will be really interesting for you as much as it is for me. Promise it's relevant. So I am in a lot of Facebook groups. I love Facebook groups and I'm in this one particular occult Facebook group where someone posted something that stopped my heart for a moment in the best kind of way. Now I'm going to give credit to this person. Their name is Kane Helson. And Cain wrote, Azazel was not a goat demon. The Jews made two goat offerings in a ceremony. One goat went to Yahweh and another to the spirit Azazel. The one to the angel 
or fallen angel, Azazel was to carry all the sins of the people and give them to Azazel to take instead. I'm going to pause my little quoting from him there because the part that's relevant, obviously, we were chatting about fallen angels today. We chatted about Azazel and I mentioned how Azazel is the main character in the novel that I'm writing. This is a novel that I felt called to write by my deity Thoth. I feel like it's very heavily guided. All of the writing that I do is an offering to Thoth. You would know this if you listened to my deity episode, I think also in my ancestors one, I've mentioned it a couple of times. Let me continue on with what Cain wrote. This ceremony is actually very similar to the Greek Hermes Creophoros rite, where a ram would take the sickness of the people rather than sin. Interesting, this is as Azazel in Jewish grimoires call upon Azazel in necromancy, only banned by Bible if using human remains. But in the exact same fashion, the Greeks call on Hermes Chthonios in necromancy. I didn't know there was a link between Azazel and Thoth. What? I'm Guys, I've gotten goosebumps again. I don't know if this is 100% accurate. Again, I'm just reading this off a Facebook group. But the fact that I'm getting goosebumps makes me think, okay, maybe there is a link here. The fact that my deity and my main character and it just feels all linked and it feels really special. And I wanted to share that with you because I thought you would think it was just as cool as me. And lastly, 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 before I let you go on your merry way, the art of psychic divination is my course that I created a couple of years ago. I only open the doors twice a year and I've actually opened them today, the day that this podcast is live, the 10th of April. Now, the very first week of those doors being open is the early bird special where you can save $300 by signing up in that first week. And for every four people who sign up, I will be offering a scholarship position to people who can't afford to pay and would really like the opportunity to take this course. It is a deep dive into the art of psychic divination, learning your psychic skills and how to interpret them, trust them, validate them, all of that, what they are, how they come through specifically for you. You learn more than 10 different forms of divination, and I mean thoroughly learn them. Things like tea leaf reading, pendulums, cartomancy, which includes tarot and oracle, astrology, palmistry, wax scrying, mirror scrying. It is so fun. So, so fun. Plus, you get my support with psychic development circles, which are live. I test your skills. I answer your questions. They are the highlight for everyone. The doors are open for new students only until the end of April 2024, and they won't be opening again until the end of the year. In the description box below, you'll see a little uh, section where it says, if you want this course, go click here. And the other part, I know a lot of you are really, really interested in my ex-evangelical class content. It is coming. My very first class is going to be Ridiculous Rapture Rhetoric. It's all about deconstructing from the Rapture Doctrine. Again, there's a wait list for that. Keep your eyes peeled. That one will 100% be out very, very soon with more to come. I didn't realize I was actually making a, a mini course with that as well, but I like my research and it was a rabbit hole that just had too many nuggets, too many nuggets of wisdom. I couldn't not share it with you all. So it turned into, so it turned from a class to a masterclass to a mini course, but you'll come away with, oh my gosh, so much peace and understanding. So I'm excited for all of that. I hope you've enjoyed this season. It's been wonderful. We've had like 18 guests. There's been 30 episodes. I'm doing 30 episodes a season. Just feels right. We've had a change up by going to weekly episodes, which was fun. I know a lot of you have loved the Hannah Help Me episodes. Keep sending in your questions. I keep note of them. And then I just intuitively pick which ones I want to answer. The more questions I have, the more episodes I can pre-do and get ready for you as well. Make sure you're following me over on social media or you're on my Witch Weekly newsletter. That's where you'll get all of the up-to-date information from me. And yes, please reply. I love hearing your replies. I love knowing I'm not just shouting into the void with emails, with podcasts, with all of those things. The more you can reply back and let me know there's a person on the other side, the happier I feel. And I'm sure you love the connection too. That's what it's all about. Connection. So I'm going to go and enjoy my time off and enjoy my time in Europe. And I will catch you all next time.